So once again, we find ourselves in the deepest recesses of the dark web with our good friend, the Dark Web Fixer. Now, this is the third part of a series, but it works perfectly well as a standalone story. So if you haven't heard the first two parts, don't worry. You can go ahead and listen to this one. And hey, you've got some more listening to do this evening, haven't you? I should warn you up front, this one is a little bit more gruesome than the stuff I normally do, and more than the first two episodes. And if that sounds like your kind of thing, then go ahead, but if not, well, go and look in the back catalogue for something else to listen to, because this one is a little bit nasty in places. Well, it's time, once again, for you all to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I should uh, preface an apology for my lack of posting as of late. I had planned a weekly entry, but when business calls on the deep web, well, you answer. Many things have happened in a very short period of time, and it's been a chaotic few weeks, to say the least. I'm writing this now from my seat aboard a private jet to a location I can't disclose yet. The job is ongoing, and rumour has it that someone is eyeing these posts. So, um, I'll be more careful until I find out if the interest is anything other than mild curiosity. The third post in this little online journal I started was planned to be about how I got into the deep web to begin with. However, recent happenings are, I think, far more interesting to hear about. Besides getting it off my chest, while it's still so recent, will be better for well, continuity's sake. A few days after my last post, I was in a speakeasy of sorts for local deep web players. No, we're not an antisocial gang, as one may assume. The owner of the place caters almost exclusively to business owners within what we call the network. A pretty close-knit group of major players in the central Florida area. The name of the place is prohibited from being shared outside of the network forum. For obvious reasons, well, it's invite only. Anyhow, the bar has many uses, from trading word-of-mouth information, conducting face-to-face -face transactions and deals, and, well, and so on. General laws don't really apply here. You don't get thrown out for starting a fight so long as you pay for damages. The place is fully sound deadened for the express reason that firearms are permitted as well. Fact is that in this place, if you start a fight, there's a 50-50 chance of turning into a gunfight. But again, you make a mess, you take care of it. Or the bar takes care of you. I don't usually pick fights, and I like to steer clear of any that get started unless there's a damn good reason for me getting involved. And on the other hand, I will throw hands if I'm paid. Plenty of other things happen on a regular basis at the joint, but those are simply secrets of the network, and I've got no interest in sharing them. And so, to the point. I was there that night to meet with some new contacts, show face to some old ones, and generally get the lowdown on any up-and-coming events. At some point, I was approached by one of the first people I became personally antiquated with early on in my ventures on the deep web. One could even say we are friends, in a sense. The mutual understanding of looking out for ourselves first, our profit second, and the network third. You see, well, once you're brought into the network, it's like being brought into the mafia. You don't talk about it, if you know what's good for you. Me? Well, I'm not too concerned. Or rather, I wasn't when I started this. Things have changed since. But those details will come later. Back to my friend, though. He approached me, and we started the usual conversation and business talk. We worked out a new deal at some point. And right before he turned to make his exit, he stopped in his tracks, as if remembering something important. He wheeled around on his heel and faced me again. He leaned in close and whispered, vodka on his breath. Oh, by the way, I heard you're back into the regular work. He leaned back, eyebrow raised. I waved my hand dismissively, sipping on my own cocktail. 
<laughs> All rumors, my friend. I smirked over my drink. I thought you knew better than to believe what you read on the internet. He chuckled softly. <laughs> yeah, okay, rumor or not. Give me a ring if you're interested. He handed me a blank business card with a phone number written on it. With a sly smile, he left. I had a few more drinks and talked to a few other people and hot bars from a more normal crowd around 1am. When the bars closed at 2, I ventured to an after party until 4, at which point I headed to my downtown apartment with a girl in tow. I kicked her out around 7 and slept until 10, at which point I awoke to someone pounding on my apartment door. Of course, I wasn't expecting visitors. With a gun in hand, I approached the front door looking through the peephole as the pounding came again, as insistent as it was when I woke. Two men in black suits stood outside. They looked like generic government spooks at first, but I noticed a symbol on the back of the hand that was knocking. Chez vous de recherche? I asked, Russian for what do you want? Well, kind of. We have a few questions for the man who lives here came the response. Uh, nah, Ingleski. Oh, my Russian isn't perfect, but it does a trick in a pinch. This time I simply said, no English. We are representatives from the network. The same man responded. Uh, Effectively, I asked them what that was. With network correspondence, outside of the bar I mentioned earlier, and the rare prepared meeting, it's standard practice to go through a series of questions and answers, phrases and code words and the like. There are a few other indicators that they are who they say they are before actual dialogue can begin. Bottom line was, I wasn't expecting anyone from the network to be contacting me in person. Regardless, they passed the usual tests, so I unlocked the door and let them in. Closing and locking the door behind them, I made no effort to hide the gun in my hand. It would keep them from thinking twice about making any sudden moves. I ushered them into my living room and offered a drink and a seat, to which they politely declined. I'd wrapped myself in just my robe to answer the door and made them wait while I put on some regular clothes. So, I asked, dropping the Russian and pouring a drink for the hangover that I realized I had. What do you want so early on a Sunday? I settled down in one of the armchairs near the window, setting the gun down on a small table next to me. We have been sent as a proxy, one of them spoke up. Uh-huh. I raised an eyebrow. What could your employer, whoever he may be, want from me? Do they know I'm retired these days? They do. This isn't about a job. The man didn't break eye contact. Hardly even blinked. He'd definitely been in some tight spots before. His companion, a much younger guy, was more on edge. Eager, even. I waited, sipping on the mimosa I'd prepared myself. We have information that you have leaked information regarding a sensitive subject matter. Do you have proof of these allegations? Do you understand the gravity of what you imply? I wasn't too disturbed. I was sure that sooner or later someone, somewhere, wouldn't be happy about information getting out. However, I had the feeling that this wasn't about my little online journal. The two of us do not. We are not privy to what it is about. Our employer has sent us to request a conference to discuss the subject. I rubbed my chin and swallowed all of my drink, thinking about it for a moment. Hmm. Who might your employer be then? I asked, standing and moving for the kitchen, opening a cabinet out of the line of sight from the two men. I palmed a small vial of a powdery white substance, shifted it into my pocket, and proceeded to make myself another drink. I'm not sure I'm at liberty to say, the man responded. Shame, I said, 
walking back to face the two men with my hand in my pocket, slowly removing the lid of the small container. I don't think I'm all that interested in the matter then. Unfortunately, you do not have a choice, the man said, reaching inside his coat. In one motion, I pulled the vial from my pocket, held it in front of my mouth and blew, sending the powder flying across the room into the faces of the other two. The effects were instant when they inhaled the stuff. The man dropped the gun he was pulling from his jacket and fell to his knees, unable to control his limbs properly. You new to the game? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Does the word subtlety hold any meaning to you? I asked, as I set the drink down and leaned over them. They collapsed onto the floor, facing up to the ceiling, mouths open and closing like fish out of water. <laughs> you come into my house this time of day? I let a few seconds pass as the drug took further effect. I turned to face the window, looking out over the cityscape. Did your employer not tell you exactly who you were coming to talk to? I sighed, turning back from my morning drink and casually walking back towards the kitchen to put the vial back where I'd gotten it. <sighs> I don't anger easily, to be honest. I turned back to the men who were moving their limbs around like they were newborn babies. <sighs> not these days, at least. But when someone shows up at my door on a Sunday with such a serious allegation... It does a little more than hurt me. I sighed, peering over them once more. <laughs> I'll find out who sent you. I smiled whimsically, knowing that I'll be satisfying my inner demons for the first time in many years. So, you can choose to tell me willingly, I shrugged. Or otherwise, it'll be your choice when the time comes. I sat down in my chair in silence, letting them fall into a deep sleep while they contemplated their life choices. After the deed was done, I rubbed my eyes and moved to use my laptop. I shot off a message to a couple of people I used to do a lot of work for back in the day. The only way I knew for sure I could get their attention now was by posting on a deep web message board, requesting a particular service. It's a weird way of getting in touch with mercenaries, I know, but their rules, not mine. From there, they would call me when they found the message, which could be minutes or hours. By the time I'd showered, eaten and dressed, they'd found the message and called. These days, Orlando has few payphones, which is weird because they never call from the same one. Been a while, the female voice spoke on the other end. I only responded, the usual place. A brief pause, and then, one hour. And with that, the line went dead. Locking up the apartment, I headed downstairs to my car and started the drive, a bookstore on the east side of town. I perused for a little while, picking up books here and there, flipping through the pages, and then putting them back on the shelf. Slowly. I paced the aisles on the first floor, eventually making my way to the second floor. I approached the rear wall and took the first book that caught my eye off the shelf. Kiss the boys goodbye. <laughs> I smirked myself at the irony of the choice. Fifteen years, a female voice spoke softly. You don't write. You don't call. I flipped through the pages of the book not looking up right away. Um, I know we didn't part ways on the best of terms. I leaned backwards against the end of a bookshelf. <laughs> Could have been worse. I hope that this time won't end the same. No, I don't think it will. I looked up to meet the eyes of a woman I thought I'd never speak to again. She was a rare breed. Real purple eyes, dark black hair and tan skin. Absolutely gorgeous specimen of a human being. Never ceased to take away my breath. I smiled lightly, brushing off the somewhat awkward conversation. 
I'll offer the usual for an, well, an extended job. She seemed to consider the offer for a few minutes before nodding. What have you got? Two men at my downtown apartment. I need them moved to a new location. Your pick, so long as it's uh, out of the way. Call me at the usual number when it's done. Should we expect trouble? She asked. I closed the book and tucked it under my arm. Nah. I gave them a pretty solid dose of pure benzoyl powder. She'll keep them out for a couple of days. I handed her the key to the apartment. Help yourself to the liquor, if any suits your taste. Or anything else there, for that matter. It's no longer a safe house. I smiled lightly and turned to walk down the steps. I paid for the book and set off for home. I had regular business to attend to. When I got home, I sent my friend a message while I packed a number of very specific tools and sets of gear. We'll call him Vincent. Vincent, I'm interested to know if your little job has anything to do with a new crew trying to muscle in on Orlando. I wasn't really in the mood for pleasantries. <laughs> Nothing escapes your information there, does it? His response was quick. I chuckled lightly to myself. <laughs> well, I got a visit in my downtown apartment this morning by some of their goons, which is vacant now, if you know anyone in the market. He ignored the offer, as I expected. Yeah, so, I don't have a name on them just yet, but I know they're working with some quite distasteful people. I want to know details. I fired off one last message before signing off. If you're in the mood for a show, keep an eye on this site. There'll be a broadcast within a day. I sent him a link to a site deep in the dark web. I shut down the computer and all the power to the house, aside from my security system and the air circulation. I had a feeling I wouldn't be home for a while. I'd packed only the essentials for myself, some clothes and toiletries, a couple of different firearms, and a load of electronic hardware. I received a message from the Mercs that they were prepared, along with an address. Smiling to myself, giddy with sick excitement, I drove quickly to meet with them. Now, what comes next, I wouldn't say I'm proud of. But some things must be done in the name of maintaining power and balance. I arrived two hours later to some farmland far outside of Orlando. Several hundred acres with a large barn and small cabin nestled in a wooded area. I did not want to be disturbed by anyone or anything. While I conducted my business with the two men who'd come to threaten myself and the men whom I had deep-rooted ties with. I met with the woman from earlier and her partner. I've been calling them Mercs, but, well, they are contract killers. We used to work together before I started the shipping business. I didn't preform any kills. I've said before, the money isn't good enough for that kind of risk and pressure. I used to run intel for them. I'd gather info from people and stakeouts and so on. Long story short, we'd been partners of a kind. They hired me, I hired them. The back and forth was a good relationship. I hadn't used them in some time due to a job going south years ago. That, and, well, my retirement. They have names, but don't use them. Never have. And their aliases are so numerous, I could literally pick any name, and they would have used it. I do have their permission to use their call signs, though. One of them, at least. The woman will go by Ghost. The man will go by Reaper. The why and what for is less important. They told me they both had men in separate rooms currently, neither awake. I had them moved into the barn, bound and gagged in chairs bolted to the ground. We worked in silence. I setting up my equipment, and them taking care of our guests. I took my time setting up several computers, cameras, antenna, and general broadcast equipment. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of Red Rooms. Well, 
I was about to host one. I needed information from these men, and they were going to tell me one way or another. I'd done this a time or two, well, the broadcasting at least. There are some sick and twisted people out there, and they look just like you and me. With everything in place in the barn, we left the Sioux for the night, retiring back to the cabin, planning on getting some sleep before a long day. The three of us taking turns on watch, in the unlikely event either of the two men woke. With morning cresting the horizon, I woke, swinging my legs from the bed and slipping into dress clothes, black slacks, a white shirt, leather belts and nice shoes. I sauntered out of the house, rolling up my cuffs to just below the elbow. I made my way down to the barn and threw open the double doors. I clicked a single key on the nearest laptop and the whole set lit up, cameras turning on and cycling. What's our count? I asked mentally, preparing myself for the role I hadn't played in many years. Ten thousand, wading and climbing, Ghost replied. I nodded. I see the name still attracts interest. <laughs> no kidding. I nodded. Get things rolling. I hit a key on a separate system, and music began to play. With a pep in my step, I pulled a black cloth face mask on and lifted it up around my nose. It covered my neck and the lower half of my face. I did this right before the lights cut off. The door swung closed, and I entered the camera frame as the recording light began to blink. Swinging my arms out to either side of me, a floodlight kicked on from overhead. Welcome to my carnal house of horrors. I spoke with a smile in my voice, staring directly into the camera. Well, yes, it has been a very long time since my last appearance, and today will be mildly different from what you may be expecting. I will attempt, to the best of my ability, to fulfill your desires regardless. I pointed to Ghost, who stood out of view of the camera. She turned up the music to an obnoxious level. She would be operating all of the broadcasting equipment, set on a 30 second delay, as to give her enough time to mute anything that might be said that I wouldn't want people hearing about. I picked up a vial of smelling salts off the tray to the viewer's right, and drifted it under the noses of the men in the chairs. They snapped awake, struggling a moment in the blinding white light from above and in front of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I started speaking again, the music being turned down so that I could be heard. These two men have information that I need. While I'll take suggestions for the gentleman just over there to your left, I will not be doing so for the first. For now, please sit back, relax, and just enjoy the show. There were butterflies in my stomach and panic on the faces of the men who threatened me in my own home. The music played, the swing beat of blues and jazz drowning out their grunts. I circled them, picking up a scalpel from the tray, and ran it lightly, blade up, across the forearms of the man who obviously knew more. The younger man showed signs of being wet behind the ears, while the one who'd done most of the talking originally seemed far more knowledgeable about the goings-on. I turned back to the camera. There will be bits of audio you viewers out there can't hear. I twirled the scalpel between my fingers. I'm sure you understand. I slammed the blade down without any warning into the man's hand. His scream was visceral. The blade slicing cleanly through missing the bones and embedding itself into the wooden arm of the chair. You will, however, still get to hear what she came for. The man in the chair shook violently, struggling against his restraints. I picked up a strip of surgical rubber and tied it just above his left bicep. It stemmed the bleeding enough, but would do nothing for the pain. So, before we go further, 
Would you care to tell me what you know? I asked, leaning my hip on his right shoulder as I pulled on a pair of black latex gloves. The man only looked up at me with hatred in his eyes. I shrugged. <laughs> I thought not. But before you get your hopes up about being rescued, I have something to share with you. I set the book I'd gotten from the bookstore down on the floor in front of him. Let me explain. This book is about how the United States left its men to be tortured and killed at the hands of the Viet Cong after the war in the 60s. Do you think your organization would even spare a passing thought for you? I asked, squatting next to him. You were not picked up by the cops or the feds, so they won't worry about you talking. Just strengthen their defenses. This is your one and only chance to tell me what I want to know. It was obvious the man held hope in his eyes still. I nodded and picked up a stick of dried bamboo and chopped long slivers off of it. You know, the Viet Cong had some pretty interesting methods of torture. I mused setting five slivers back on the table. I took his left hand in mine and gripped his pinky first, bending it backwards until it cracked, and then repeated the process for his ring finger, middle finger, and index. I wanted to prevent him moving his fingers too much. After a few minutes, he collected himself enough to talk. Why? Why what? I asked. Ah, this? Why go to these lengths? He asked, looking around, trying to see past the floodlights. I smirked. The torture, or the production of it. Why not just kill us, or beat it out of us in your apartment? He asked. Well, I don't kill people. I don't like to, at least. I think it's a waste. I leaned on the nearby table. Everyone has worth to someone. He looked at me. I was unsure if he was shocked at my words, or just in shock still from the pain. You'll do this, but not kill a man? He asked. I shook my head. One's life isn't mine to take. That's why I pay others to do it when it needs doing. You got some serious problems, guy. His voice was low, insulting. No, I think you have the right idea about this situation. You are the one with the serious problems right now, and you can easily solve them. I put both hands on his wrists and leaned in close. Just tell me what I want to know, and this can end before it has to go any further. He spat into my face. Fuck you. I simply wiped it from my eyes and then cleaned my hand on his shirt. Very well. We'll continue. I picked up one of the bamboo splinters and gently pressed it under the nail of his pinky. His grunting, painful cries from my handling of the broken fingers gave way to guttural screams of primal agony. I left it there inspecting it to be sure that it had reached maximum depth. You know, I looked him in the face. Your partner over there already looks ready to talk. The younger man's eyes were wide with horror, fixed on my actions. The man who had my attention, however, had his eyes screwed shut tightly, tears forcing their way out of the corners. His teeth clenched so tight... I became worried he might crack them. Here. I shoved a knife-handle-sized piece of multi-layered leather between his teeth. Bite down on that. I'd hate to see those pearly whites go to waste too early. He looked up at me, confused for a minute. But I was already onto my next task. Lighting a fire at the tip of the bamboo splinter. Oh, this is going to be a very long day. I smiled at him, though only my eyes showed it. And so it went, one by one. All five fingers on his left hand, and all five fingers on his right hand. 
He broke when I started on his toes. He spit out the gag onto the floor, landed with a wet flop. Okay, okay, okay. He breathed heavily in a panic through laboured sobs as I was about to begin breaking his toes. I'll tell you what you want to know. I looked him over. His skin was oily with sweat. His shirt soaked through. Hair matted to his head. He looked worse off than I'd expected him to. I hadn't even moved past his hands. What a disappointment. His body shook as he forked over info on several groups and events that had transpired in the last few months. I can't tell you everything he told me, not yet. I'll put it like this, though. That group I mentioned in my last post? Zero? Yeah, I thought their members had disbanded. Turns out, there was just a coup. They've still got the power and reach that they once had, just under a new banner. And they're supporting a crew that's looking to out the current network leaders. Yep, there's a few other people looking to carve out a piece of the Orlando pie for themselves. Look, I know that this may be a little short this time. But my flight isn't very long. I can't see everything just yet. After the job is done, I may be able to let you guys in on what's all going on here. However... With the potential for a lot of ice to be on this post from people I don't want to know that I'm coming from them. Let's hope it's not you that I turn up for. So a question that's often asked of me is, uh, when are you doing the next episode of so-and-so, and when's the next part of so blah, 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 coming up? And well, the truth is, I'm often waiting on the authors. That's not a bad thing. They obviously want to write the story as well as they can, and make it as enjoyable for you as is possible. So please, you know, bear with them, bear with me. I'll get there in the end. But I do, of course, listen to you all and try to give you the stories that you want to hear. Hope you like that one. I did warn you about the gruesome bits, didn't I? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> well, that is enough for me for one week, but I, of course, will be back again on Monday, and I do so hope you're all going to join me again. So you will. Go on, make my weekend. There you go. Right? Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?